usual disclaimer and we're going straight to the subject matter for today freedom of expression under the european convention on human rights article 10 filming and photography in public is the main topic when we're discussing this Generally, filming in public is not a crime. A public place is, includes any highway and any other premises or place to which the, which at the material time the public have or are permitted to have access, whether on payment or otherwise. Now, I'm just going to go through that. It's Section 33 of the Criminal Justice Act 1972, which quite a lot of vloggers know let's talk about the definition it includes a highway a highway is a place where someone can pass and repass uh, and that includes footpaths bridleways and other places that the public can pass and repass and any other premises or place to which at the material time the public have or are permitted to have access whether on payment or otherwise. Now, that's a little bit more complicated because if a premises is effectively private property some of the time and then public property when it's open, then if you trespass actually when it's not open and it's clearly obvious that it isn't open, uh, then you don't have the right of access because it's not public. And it doesn't matter if you, may, if you have to make a payment to have access or otherwise, it's still capable of being a public place. I think it's better to give some examples and situations I've seen on some vlogs to give you an idea of what that means. Let's go to the industrial estate. A private property developer buys a plot of land and puts industrial premises on that plot of land and then rents them out to different firms. The access to and from those firms is on an access road which the private contractor as part of his planning permission has to build it is private land initially however if the public have access all the time to that road because the firms are open 24 7 then it will become a public place because the public have access on payment or otherwise, and its access is needed 24 hours. Generally speaking, some vloggers are right. If you start seeing uh, highway signs, references to planning permission on the lampposts, bus stops, etc., then it's pretty clearly public access. Part of it may be public access and then the other parts may be private access because different people rent that particular industrial estates sites or businesses. It depends how the industrial estate is set up. If it's lots of units, one road and people uh, park next to their units in a general area, then in those circumstances, it's pretty well all public except inside the buildings. If on the other hand, they are gated premises and there appears to be gates and those gates are closed and locked, well, clearly it's private when it's locked, but it may well be public when it's open. Another example would include situations like theatres, car parks, uh, multi-storey car parks and places 
uh, like cinemas, those and uh, sports stadium. They will have give public access for public to use their facilities to park a car, to uh, go and watch a football match, to go to the theatre, etc. It is a public place when it is at the material time open to the public on payment or otherwise. But that permission can be revoked by the person who owns the property or can be de delegated to their security. For example, stewards in nightclubs who are, used to be called bouncers can physically remove you from the club on the basis that you're not complying with their their terms under their contract or you're misbehaving. They can physically lay their hands on you and throw you out if you refuse to leave. In football and other sports stadium, stewards again can physically remove you from the premises. So it, it isn't true to say because it's a civil matter, trespass is a civil matter, most of the time, but not all the time. Then in these circumstances, um, it can give the right for the person to have you physically removed if you refuse to leave. And that wouldn't be an assault because they are evicting you from their premises, as you can if someone goes into your home without consent and you tell them to leave and they don't. That's another topic and another conversation. So hopefully that's explained some of the pitfalls of a public place. The last bit I wanted to talk about a public place to you about is the situation where there are no barriers, physical barriers, and you enter the, the area believing it's part of the public area, which is easily done, but it turns out that someone says it's not a public place. That can be tricky because defining or being able to establish whether it is a public place or not is not always clear. Ownership of the land doesn't necessarily mean it's not a public place at that time. But if that person clearly has authority over the area, which may have been delegated to them, and they ask you to leave, then my advice would be that you leave if you're at all unsure of whether it's a public place or not. If you are sure it's a public place, obviously then the person who telling you to leave is wrong, but you have to be sure. Next slide. Where do human rights come from? Well, they come from the European Convention on Human Rights. They come from the UN Declaration on Human Rights. They come from other declarations from the UN and they come from our own legislation, the Human Rights Act 1998. This slide tells us about the Human Rights Act 1998, Section 6. And tell, it tells us that the Act, Human Rights Act, applies to all public authorities. 6.1, it is unlawful for a public authority to act in a way which is incompatible with convention right. Section 6.3 defines a public authority as including any court or tribunal and any person certain of whose functions are functions of a public nature. In other words, the definition of public authority includes anyone performing public functions. So that tells us
that the pleas are subject to the Human Rights Act 1998, as are many, many different organisations such as departments, local authorities, the list is very extensive. But we're concentrating on the police on this one. For our purposes, we can say the police are covered. And this is confirmed through the Association of Chief Police Officers guidance. A link is there. There's a link. Page nine of that document says at 4.38, there are no powers prohibiting the taking of photographs, films or digital images in a public place. Therefore, members of the public and press should not be prevented from doing so. So the chief officers recognise that filming in public is an entitlement under their human rights or everyone's human rights for that matter. But filming in public isn't always protected. There are what they say derogations, which are things that the, uh, the national governments can put in place to protect for certain reasons. Yes, everyone has the right to freedom of expression, Article 10. And that's here. I won't read it all out. You can see. Article 8, on the other hand, says the Convention recognises the right to respect for privacy and family life. Everyone has the right to respect for his private and family life, his home and his correspondence. That's Article 8. So these things two rights can come into conflict at times. Public to private filming. In most circumstances, it's legal. If you're filming in public, there isn't a general expectation of people in that public area or people who are outside the public area in a private area which can be filmed from public there's no normally no expectation of privacy however that's not always the case for example upskirting voyeurism it's an offense public nuisance which is a common law offense which means it's not written in statute it's part of our common law and i'll do a whole lecture on common law later uh, in the year because it's quite a complicated thing but take it from me it's common law pub public nuisance is a criminal offense and it can be defined as an unlawful act or omission which endangers or interferes with the lives comfort property or common rights of the general public in my view, this might cover hidden cameras in public toilets, cameras covertly, covertly filming through windows for peeping toms. There are also offences in relation to stalking and filming and following individuals and harassing them. So, although you can film in public, there are some restrictions and you have to be aware that if someone particularly if you're filming into someone's private home and someone reasonably expects some privacy in their own home then you are putting yourself at risk of being subject to criminal action under ASBOs or public nuisance 
or under voyeurism. Looking at the case law, Director of Public Prosecutions, Jones and Another, 1998, Court of Appeal case, a public highway is a public place which the public may enjoy for any reasonable purpose, provided the activity in question does not amount to a public or private nuisance and does not obstruct the highway by unreasonably impeding the primary right of the public to pass and repass. That's pretty clear. It's a public place. You can enjoy access, you can film from it, but you're not uh, entitled to uh, become a public nuisance or uh, private nuisance. You're not entitled to obstruct the uh, road or pathway unreasonably. And you've got to bear in mind that people are entitled to be able to get past you backwards and forwards. Let's look specifically at police auditing and demonstrations in public and ask ourselves, looking at the law, are the police acting unlawfully? In my view, on many occasions they are, and in some cases they're breaching the Human Rights Act 1998, which we know applies to them. We will consider in this lecture and, and other lectures some of the excuses for obstructing photography in public and to, for detaining people who are filming the police. We will consider willful obstruction of the highway, obstruct police under the Police Act, Section 43 of the Terrorism Act, other powers to stop and detain and require details, use of antisocial behaviour, crime and policing, that's ASBOs, and we will consider how to tackle or uh, at least stand up to the police in relation to their use of these powers if they're using them wrongly. Showed Charing Cross Police Station and some police officers standing outside. It goes directly onto a public road and the public have access on payment or otherwise. The police are being filmed by X. In this pretend scenario, the public place has a police station and has some officers outside. X is filming them because he's interested. In these circumstances, because he's filming in public and those officers are in public, and don't have any reasonable expectation of privacy, that that is lawful and uh, it is a protected right under freedom of expression, Article 10. In our scenario, an officer approaches him and, and says, why are you filming? X says, for public interest. Then the officer replies, because you are filming a police station, I reasonably suspect that you may be committing an act of terrorism and I'm detaining you under Section 43 of the Terrorism Act in order to conduct a search. Next slide. Section 43 of the Terrorism Act is about the power to search people. 
Section 43.1, a constable may stop and search a person whom he reasonably suspects to be a terrorist to discover whether he has in his possession anything which may constitute evidence that he is a terrorist. That's key. So the constable must have a genuine and objective reasonable suspicion that the person he has detained, in this case who's filming openly in public, is a terrorist before he can exercise the power of search and to detain him. Would a reasonable person objectively, so not a police, another police constable, but a reasonable person, conclude that someone filming is a terrorist on the basis that they are filming a police station or police officers? In my view, the answer is no. A reasonable person would want a lot more information before they would suspect that person of being a terrorist and therefore activate the right of search. In fact, if you think about it, the last thing a terrorist who is doing what they call hostile reconnaissance wants to do is to attract attention by openly standing and filming as if they're engaged in that hostile reconnaissance. A reasonable officer would remember that they that filming goes on in public all the time. There are cars that have film cameras operating on them like Tesla cars. Some cyclists have headbands with uh, cameras on them. Others have hope people have mobile phones who may be recording the police officers because they're interested. They could be tourists who've never seen British police before. The huge number of reasons why people would want to whip out their phone and record the police outside Charing Cross Police Station in these circumstances. So in the scenario that I've set, it's clear that the police officer doesn't have objectively reasonable suspicion. Now this is confirmed because the police uh, conduct or the police college has set up when searches are effective and fair and reasonable. The College of Policing has developed a definition of a fair and effective stop and search. It says a stop and search is more, most likely to be fair and effective when the search is justified, lawful, and it stands up to public scrutiny. Well, in the example I've given, it's neither justified, lawful, and it certainly doesn't stand up to any public scrutiny. The officer has a genuine and objective reasonable suspicion that he will find a prohibited article or item for use in crime. In these circumstances, why is he searching him? Does he expect to find evidence of terrorism or is he just doing it to express his authority? Is the search proportionate? Does he, I'm meaning the officer, genuinely believe he's got a terrorist in front of him? No, he doesn't. Clearly not on that basis. Four core elements underpin the definition. The decision to stop and or search a person must be fair. The search must be legal and the interaction with the public must be professional. And the officer is accountable for exercising their stop and search powers. 
So, the College of Policing have set out here clear guidance. In my scenario, is the officer exercising that guidance clearly? Or is he um, simply stamping his authority, using his authority to um, shut someone down who he considers to be uh, annoying? If you look at YouTube and look at a lot of police audits, there is a plethora, that means lots, a plethora of uh, stops and searches that are on this basis, when no reasonable person could conclude that the person was acting suspiciously and with sufficient justification for the police to search on the basis that he's doing or she's doing hostile reconnaissance because they're filming in public holding a camera up right by the back of a police station or the front of a police station in plain view In our next lecture, we will look at the police misuse of ASBOs and the Highways Act and other examples of where the police are using other powers allegedly to justify stopping, searching or detaining people who are filming in public. Thanks for listening. Subscribe, please, to this channel, Law Rights and all that. We're on Facebook. You can like us. And we're also on the internet. Thanks for listening. Bye.